Tell me, how has the pursuit of righteousness shaped your life? The more I pursue God's presence and his righteousness, I begin to alter my life, not to things that may be naturally be easy to do, but where I begin to say, God, what have you called me to be in this life? Hey, welcome to Right Side Up. This season of the Daniel Strickland Podcast, you are in the right place. And this episode is off the charts. Uh, We have two incredible um, guests, Joe Saxton asking the question. If you don't know Joe Saxton, you really should. Just go to joesaxton.com and you'll read all about the latest books, Ready to Rise. She's a coach. She's a podcaster. The Lead Stories podcast is hers and just filled with fantastic uh, things. Her Instagram feed is nonstop uh, fun and you can connect with her on all the different forms and mediums. I am thrilled to say that Jo Saxton is a friend and she is a coach to me. And we've kind of tracked together, albeit from different countries and backgrounds and situations, but in sort of the missional space and the leadership space and the coaching space and the speaking space. And so Jo is just filled with wisdom. And I'm so excited that she was able to ask these questions. Now, what's cool about this posture for Jo is that this is her normal posture. She is a genuinely curious person and she is always looking to learn and to grow. And that's one of the things that makes her leadership so infectious. And uh, this is the beatitude they're talking about called blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be filled. And I think what a beautiful beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness or justice. That's the same root word in the scriptures. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for things to be made right in this world. And two guests, the first Joe Saxton and the other is Princess Zulu from Zambia. Now, Princess Zulu from Zambia is a rock star. She is epic. I mean, she's been all around the globe to the UN with World Vision to Western nations everywhere because she is a massive advocate and spokesperson for the prevention of AIDS. And Princess Zula has this like, Zulu has this like crazy life story. Uh, She's got a book, which just might be easier to read the book of her life called Warrior Princess. She was orphaned, both of her parents through AIDS and her baby sister, she lost them all. And then at 18, you know, after a life on the street, she only went to grade nine, she didn't finish high school, but kind of was seasoned by life on the street. She also was diagnosed with an HIV positive diagnosis at a time where there weren't, uh, wasn't treatment available and she sort of had no uh, idea what she was gonna do. And she'll tell you in this podcast, just the providence of God, that she began to actually hunger and thirst to try to make a difference in the world. And and uh, have, a, have a listen to her. She's filled with wisdom and insights, particularly about this, like this insatiable thirst to do better, to make the world better, to be better, to, to, to use every circumstance that you have for something greater than even just your own self. And Princess Zulu is a light on a shining hill, an example of this, a strong leader. She's a politician in the Zambian government. She's leading hundreds of thousands of people in her district. I mean, she's literally, guys, she's a rock star. She's epic, but she's also filled with wisdom from the scripture. She obviously lives out what she believes and uh, also uh, survived COVID on top of an HIV uh, diagnosis. That's a lot. She's uh, one of those vulnerable folks. And thank God she has fully recovered and is in fine form and was able to give us some fantastic stuff today. So listen in. We have Joe Saxton and we have Princess Zulu from Zam- Zambia discussing how we are blessed when we hunger and thirst after righteousness and justice. Tell me, how has the pursuit of righteousness shaped your life? I think for me, uh the hunger and thirstiness for righteousness has really been um, a centering uh, theme in my life because uh, I think it's important to understand as, as human beings, uh, left to ourselves, we are self-centered, uh, left to ourselves, uh, we only look inwardly and not outwardly, and especially in times of crisis, uh, not only in the crisis of HIV and AIDS, but now with the uh, crisis of COVID-19, um, the natural thing to do is to coward in. But uh, over the years, I have learned that the more I pursue God's presence and His righteousness, 
I begin to alter my life, not to things that may be naturally be easy to do, but where I begin to say, God, what have you called me to be in this life? Not that it's always easy, not that it's always uh, <laughs> uh, um, easy as to say it, to be obedient, but I think it begins to call you to be obedient, to be obedient to that one thing that God called you to be in this life. And I think for me, it has been to be able to reach out to others, those who may feel hopeless, to say, God is faithful. And you know, one of the scriptures that I've also tried to, to work with is uh, be still and know that I'm God. What do you do when everything is shaking around you? What do you do when there is no guarantee for tomorrow? Because that is what being told I was HIV positive in 1997 did. There was no guarantee that I'll still be alive in 2020. There was no guarantee that I'll go on to, to have uh, children who will live up to their fullest and have a grandchild. But you know, I realized that the more I centered on others, because I told myself, I cannot change my life, but I can change someone else's life. Whether it's just to bring a, a smile, whether it is to share my story with a passion like there's no tomorrow. And suddenly it helped a village, it helped a community, it helped an individual. In that way, not only um, did I see God do miracles for others, but I think in return, I found that I had opportunities to go back to school. I had opportunities, uh, uh, doors were opened, uh, jobs were created just because I pursued after God's heart. And I think there's one word in Hebrew, uh, hesed. Uh, I have forgotten all my Hebrew uh, lessons or language, but hesed stands out for me because it talks about God unconditional love, one that pursues us. So even as we talk about the, the, the Beatitudes of uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirsty, after God's own righteousness, in actuality, it is God who pursues us. It is God who comes after that, us. And when we submit to his calling, when we, we say yes to his righteousness, we become better people and hopefully uh, better for others in this world. What can I know about the pursuit of righteousness that will help me encounter God at a deeper level? I think for uh, seeking God at a deeper level or pursuing God at a, at a deeper level is first of all to understand that as long as we remain on this earth, it is a continuous process. It is never arrived at like a destination where you arrive. However, the beauty and the discovery of knowing God at a, at a, at a deeper level is in the journey itself. I think many other times that um, uh, uh, as individuals, as Christians, and there are even non-Christians, we are scared for the unknown. And no wonder why uh, the saying goes that uh, courage is not the absence of fear, but the ability to keep moving in the presence of fear. That is what has made others become courageous people, or that is what has made other people inspire us. So I think for me, it has been important to understand that I am not being called to a life of perfection, but I am being called to a life of beauty. And that in this bigger puzzle, my piece of my story belongs there. And the one who holds the entire puzzle is God himself. And I think it is important to underscore that because many other times that we think we are in charge of our story. And so we begin to wait for a time when it will be perfect. But there's no such a thing because the very difficulties in our lives, they become the message that inspire other people, that cause other people to who God is. So I think as we understand and as we want to walk deeper in our walk with God is understanding that part of the journey in itself is getting closer to God and that I will never arrive at that journey until I'm out of this world. But yet every day I work up like there is no other day. And every day I know that someone else even in my weakest time, 
would be an inspiration to someone else. How does this pursuit of righteousness connect with blessing in your life? I think in pursuing uh, righteousness, I have come to realize that, uh, like I've already alluded to, it is a journey. Uh, there's no end or there is no arriving at the destination, but it is the process in which not only uh, am I being uh, purified uh, at every stage of life, but I'm also getting a um, little glimpse of what maybe Christ went through. You know, um, there are moments when things are so difficult and uh, you want to respond in a, a fleshly way. Uh, truth be told. Um, and sometimes I had to tell myself, okay, princess, this is where you take the Jesus route, I call it. And I find that when I say that to myself, I even act out in a more positive way, maybe to someone who wasn't being kind to me or where I was treated wrongly, um, where I take the highway than maybe revenging. I find that actually the blessing has come not only from the material things that I end up seeing coming my way, but it's the joy, you know, the unspeakable joy. And this is what I think for me, another scripture that has stood up, the joy of the Lord is my strength. One of my daughters, her first name is Joyce, after my mother. But when I learned that I was HIV positive, I clearly felt like a bright light shine through my room where the doctor told me this. And even though it wasn't an audible voice, I paid like God saying, praise me. In that moment, you are talking of 1997. There's no treatment for people living with HIV, not the treatment we know today, not the stories we know of people now living 25, 30 years. That was nothing. And yet in that moment, I thought God saying, praise God. And I know when I've shared that part of the story, people say, are you okay? I guess God will make you to act in a way that sounds not natural in the human sense. But I took it that God gave me the joy in the midst of that situation. And that is why a scripture that says, um, joy that comes from the Lord is more than happiness. And I think for me, that is how I paraphrase that. And those are the blessings because look, when we do not hunger for righteousness, when we do not uh, move towards forgiving others, forgiving ourselves, it becomes a thorn and poison in our own bodies. So the more we release others, the more we forgive others, the more we forgive ourselves, not only is it a blessing in the end, maybe materially, but it also it becomes a blessing because of the inner peace that we begin to enjoy. And when people encounter us, they can see this unspeakable joy, and it is the joy of the Lord that surpasses our circumstances, surpasses our situations. I'd love to know what you've seen when a group of people are pursuing righteousness together, a family, a group of people at church, a community. How has their collective pursuit of righteousness impacted a wider community? I think for me, when you understand the power when you connect yourself to God's call on your life and just the amazing things that begin to take place. Now imagine it's five people. Imagine it's 10 people in a community, in a church, in a family setting, pursuing God's righteousness. Imagine the ripple effects that will come out of that. Imagine the legacies we will leave behind. Imagine the marks that we make. And that is the power of not only pursuing God's righteousness as an individual, because what good does it do if I'm the only one? And that is why there is an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. So when we pursue righteousness, as individuals, of course, it begins from there. But imagine the power and the energy that comes out of it. Because now as a group, now as a community, now as a family, now as husband and wife, we are pursuing the same thing. 
What about at the national level? As a country, where we begin to say, it's not how I feel. But what does God say? What is the righteous thing to do? And I think it will make us do things differently. How I look at my neighbor, how I look at someone else who's of a different skin tone, how I conversate with someone whom I have different views, all will be actually filtered because of my pursuit of righteousness. And that is why it's so critical when you look at the Beatitudes, which says, blessed are those who hunger. When you are hungry, you have to eat something. When you are thirsty, you have to quench the thirst. So those metaphors, Christ uses them so powerfully and so intentional because we cannot survive without eating. We cannot survive without drinking. And you know very well that uh, is it 80% of our bodies is made out of water. That is how important it is. And now imagine that collectively there is this movement where we are saying we are after God's righteousness. We are after God's justice. Because social justice has a limitation. My own kind of righteousness has a limitation. Because I'm so human that at some point I'm going to break down. At some point I'm going to give up. But when I anchor my, 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 my pursuit of righteousness in God's righteousness, I begin to fade as an individual. And then God begins to take place. And imagine that at a macro level. Imagine that for the nation of America. Imagine that for the nations of the world. Imagine that in a country like Zambia. What a world of difference it will be. Hence why we cannot arrive at the destination of pursuit of God's righteousness. We have to continue. We have to keep at it. Because the more we pursue God's righteousness, the more we become better people at an individual level. The more we become better mothers. The more we become better fathers. The more we become better community members and society members. Our politics will be so much based on not, I want to win the conversation, but where is the middle ground? Where is the common denominator? Because Christ came so that we may have life and life in its fullness. Okay, wow. Wow, 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 wow. First of all, Joe Saxton asking the questions. <laughs> And she's really good at this. And these questions were so fantastic. What does it mean to you to pursue righteousness? What does that even mean? And Princess Zulu just like throwing it down, right? Um, just to reach out to others, you know, to actually do the things that the scripture tells us to do. You know, I just love just her practical nature of this. And also this uh, be still, you know, when everything else is shaking around you. And then I think a takeaway for me was when Princess Zulu said, you know, I couldn't change my life circumstances. I was diagnosed with HIV positive. I was an orphan. I was uneducated. Like I had nothing really to do that I could change my own life, but I could change someone else's trajectory. I could change the circumstances for somebody else like me. And I think that shift you know, because so often, of course, we think of the blessing being ours. And then she explains that as she made that shift, as she actually just hungered and thirsted for things to be made right in the world so that other people wouldn't contract the disease, so that other people wouldn't hang out with these stigmas that would isolate people with this disease, so that the HIV wouldn't be a death sentence to every single person that received it. You know, when she started working towards that, she said then, then the door started opening, then the blessing, you know, that you will be filled as she began to spend herself on behalf of the hungry. This is Isaiah 58, right? Then the, the sun rises with righteousness in his wings, right? Then, then the sun rises with healing and hope. And sometimes we just get that so confused. But I think there is something that Princess Zula helps us to understand in this filling that is a blessing, this participation in Jesus is as we hunger and thirst, as we give ourselves to make things right, 
You know, we can't always change our own circumstances, but we can uh, hunger and thirst for things to be made better for other people. I love that. Then she dropped the hesed word in Hebrew about God's unconditional love and that he pursues us, you know, that he pursues us. So this pursuit of hunger, this hunger and thirst, this insatiable appetite, you know, we, we witnessed Jesus in the scriptures saying, you know, I have food that you don't know of. And the disciples saying, aren't you hungry? And he goes, I have a hunger that you don't know of, right? Like I've got to eat righteousness and justice for breakfast. You know what I mean? Like as he gives himself over to this insatiable thirst and appetite for things to be made right in our lives and in this world, then there is some kind of filling that happens. We get caught up in that promise. Um, I love that she said this hunger and thirst, this blessing is not a destination, we're not ever just fully satisfied because it's a journey and that it's an invitation to allow the hunger to lead us more and more into Jesus and into the work that he calls us. So I love that, you know, dropping uh, Princess Zulu drops courage is not the absence of fear, but the ability to keep moving in the presence of fear. I love that, that we are, you know, we are meant to keep on, you know, to not give up. And it is so easy to give up when we can't see immediate results. And I think one of the things that I, I saw oozing through the screen, if you have a chance to see Princess Sulu in person, you know, it, there's a visual of her. This is posted on YouTube. So you can have a look at the people who are asking the questions and also answering them. And Princess Zulu, you know, she's just, I mean, you can see her exuding through her body even and through the the and in her, in her words you can tell this in the confidence in which she speaks that um that she is courageous because she doesn't stop you know there is more to do and then she talks about that how like when she was just first diagnosed and living as an orphan without much of a future you know just surviving maybe was the first thing to do and then she kind of got over this it's about me thing and she started actually and you should read the book story of her life because it's insane she would like uh hitchhike and talk to transport truck drivers about like why they shouldn't have sex with people on the road because it was transmitting this disease and that they could die. And she just started educating people just naturally it like on the corners of the street and things like that. And as she began to hunger and thirst to make things right in the world, then of course she, she was influencing more people until now she's influencing all over the globe. You know, she's this voice of influence when it comes to the prevention and the, uh, the, the getting rid of the stigma, stigmatization of, of AIDS and HIV. So every day she says she wakes up and there is no other day. Today is the day. Today is the day that this blessing of hungering and thirsting for righteousness and justice <clears throat> is a daily, uh, is a daily blessing. This is a blessing for today. And I loved that. Uh, the process of the journey, she says, is a purifying agent for me and an opportunity for me to get a glimpse of what Jesus feels every day. What? Can we just stop for the process of the journey? So, so not the destination, not like when I realize it, but even the journey, even the process of it, the frustration of it, the, the desire that's unmet, you know, just the, the struggle of it, the fear, what other people think, you know, just the, the pressure against, just think about all the things that are involved in the process. And she says, the very process of the journey is a purifying agent for me and an opportunity or an invitation to get a glimpse of what Jesus feels every day. And this is, you know, the Apostle Paul, we hear, I want to share in the resurrection, but I also want to share in the death and the suffering, because somehow in the invitation of the blessed life, this invitation to participate with Jesus, the process of all of those blessings of mourning, of grieving, of meekness, of humility, of, you know, all the things that we've looked at, a poverty of spirit even, is always this invitation to enter in to the person of Jesus. Whew. And then I love this little thing she said. This is where you take the Jesus route. I say, I, she said, I say this to myself whenever I want to do something else. I want to give up or I want to like judge people or whatever it is. I want to respond in anger or fear. She says, I tell myself, this is where you take the Jesus route. I love that. I feel like we should just put it on bumper seats. Like this is where, this is the moment right here when you think that you should just say what you feel and have no regard to other people's feelings. You know what I mean? Like this is, uh, this is where you take the Jesus route. I just feel like we should 
Ah, uh, that was so good. That was so good for me because I have actually, I'm going to adopt that. I'm taking that from Princess Zulu and I'm applying it to my own life. Like right in that place where I feel like, no, I don't have enough energy or I'm too afraid or people might not like me or I'm going to back down because this just got too difficult. I'm going to say to myself, no, this is where you take the Jesus route. I can do this uh, because I am in Christ. The joy of my Lord is my strength. So she's been, um, she, and, uh, one of the other things about Princess Zulu that was really cool is when she just shared about how when she got her AIDS diagnosis, now r remind yourself that this is after losing both of her parents and her baby sister to, to AIDS. So when she got her HIV diagnosis is 1997, so it's a few years after that, but you can imagine how devastating it is when you've lost your entire family to this disease and then you're diagnosed with that, the same disease. As she was getting the diagnosis, she explains a bright light shines through the hospital room and she hears God say, praise me. Wow. And then she says, God will lead you to act in an in unnatural human way in order to display the supernatural power of the kingdom of God. God will lead you to live. And I think even just that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that that it's an unnatural way in some, in, in some desire, but it's to demonstrate the power of God. And then, of course, the big question, which Joe just laid down there. And I think Princess Zulu helped us because she was saying, like, I want you to imagine it. You know, what have you seen when people are pursuing righteousness together? But I just want to say this. I went to Zambia. I've been to Zambia a whole bunch of times. I think it's, it's one of my favorite countries. It's one of the poorest nations in the world, actually. And I took a bunch of leaders there from Australia when I was living there at the time. And instead of going to like teach and, you know, bring all the money and do all the things like normal sort of missional trips uh, to developing world, we actually went to learn from the Zambians because Zambians had so much to teach us. For example, Zambia had an AIDS orphan crisis, okay? And this is what Princess Zulu was living through, an AIDS orphan crisis. So like one in three kids were like, were abandoned because their parents had died. It was, it was insane. But when you go to Zambia, you won't see orphans on the street, you know, especially in rural communities. So we went to a rural community. We didn't see any orphans. And we're like, we thought there was an orphan crisis. And they're like, yeah, there is. But what happened was because the Zambians are committed to a community uh, way of life, they just absorb the orphans into their family. So much so that when you ask a Zambian uh, you know, parent, you ask a Zambian father, how many kids do you have? He'll say, I have four of my own and six others. That's what they'll say. I have three of my own and four others. Like everybody says, I have this many of my own and this many others. And the, this many others are the children that they brought into their family during the orphan crisis. And I mean, it, well, I mean, it's insane, right? When you think about it. And I remember like, it was so hard for us to introduce ourselves as learners because this idea that the West has something to, you know, we're always gonna rescue Africa. And we forget actually that Africa has so much to rescue us, that this relationship that we have with each other uh, is reciprocal. You know, we, we have some mutuality here. Like we need what it is that you have. so. They kept introducing us as these like teachers and these leaders and like all these things who are going to help us. And finally, I stood up and I said, look, you know, in Australia, and this is true of all Western countries, we have a, a, all orphans, thousands and thousands of orphans, and nobody will invite them into their homes. And you could hear the congregation just <gasps> gasp, you know, at the, the sheer ridiculousness of it. And, and then I said, you know, in Australia, we have these massive buildings church buildings, like really beautiful church buildings, and they're empty because nobody goes to church. <gasps> and then I said, and you know, one of the leading causes of death in Australia is loneliness. People die by themselves and nobody even knows. <gasps> it was shock. And then the next time we were introduced, finally, it was clear. The leader stood up and said, these poor Australians have come to Zambia to learn from us. See, this is what's happening in this Right Side Up podcast if you're not tracking. We're trying intentionally to take another posture. We're trying to listen and to learn and to live. We're trying to do things differently because that's what Jesus invites us to do. It's upside down, but like Princess Zulu has so much to teach me about uh, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, about living a blessed life, about what it means to be filled. And I am so honored 
that she taught us and that these all of these people have been teaching us and we've just been being filled by their wisdom and hope and experience in their lives. This has been such an incredible episode. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And hey, what we'd love for you to do is consider taking this wisdom and applying it in your life. So we're inviting everyone to join us in the Matthew 25 challenge. Everybody, I have sent out invitations, everyone involved in this podcast. This is where your family journeys with my family and we just take one week of our lives to press in to what it's like and what it is for people all around the globe so that we can do this as a global community. We enter into the blessing of being like Christ when we understand that his life is global and uh, his family is all around the world. And uh, he hungers and thirsts for us to be made right. So we think this will be a great tool to help make things right and right side up in your family, in your values, in your life, in the way that you spend your money, in the way that you uh, express gratitude for what it is that you have, in the way that you steward uh, your own life and your own platform and your own voice and your own witness. So join us in the Matthew 25 challenge. The way to join us is really simple. If you're in the US, please text BLESSED to 44888, 44888. And if you're in Canada, just text BLESSED to 98669. And if you're tracking with us from around the world, please join us. Just go to worldvision.org slash right side up, worldvision.org slash right side up. And let's do this Matthew 25 challenge together. Let's live a blessed life. Live in this upside down culture of a world in which we find ourselves. Let's live right side up.